Welcome Bethlehem Lutheran Church to this service of worship as we gather to celebrate our Lord's glorious resurrection and anticipate, of course, in a couple weeks, uh, gathering uh, together for Lent. And just a reminder that uh, we'll have Ash Wednesday, both a drive-through service for those who aren't coming out at night and then an evening service as well. And then we'll have five subsequent weeks of uh, Wednesday night gatherings here. We're gonna really work through the Psalms uh, this Lent, how to pray the Psalms. So I invite you to come along on that journey as we uh, march toward Holy Week and uh, of course Easter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus, make us instruments of your peace that where there is hatred, we may so love, where there is injury, pardon, and where there is despair, hope. Grant, O Divine Master, that we may seek to console, to understand, and to love in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
A reading from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 45. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ru ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your sons, Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there since there are five more years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But somebody will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead, what is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What am I saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter, beginning in the 27th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our triune God. Amen. I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. In Luke chapter 6, we hear one of those dense and difficult sermons that can leave us feeling like we've been drinking from a fire hose. And as a preacher, there's an added burden here because isn't it a little presumptuous to preach a sermon on a sermon? To think that as a preacher, I can add anything to our Lord's proclamation? Maybe we can consider what we're doing today a work of translation or theological imagination. Our aim is a bit more modest, just to hear some old words, but with fresh ears. I think in order to do that, we have to begin by acknowledging just how heavy these words are. That our Lord isn't just offering good advice this morning. This isn't one of those it would be nice if every once in a while you did this for me kind of speeches. No, this is our Lord saying, take a look. This is what Christian discipleship looks like in practice. Now that word love we know is a tricky one. Many languages, Greek among them, have many different words for love. But in our culture, love covers over a multitude of meanings. As my friend and fellow Lutheran pastor uh, Ryan Stout put it in a sermon a few years back, Quote, we throw the word love around rather casually, especially during the second week of February. We most often mistake love, I think, for feeling in love, which is a very different thing. More seriously, however, we often mistake love for something primarily about us, about our needs and desires. But that's not love. That's just appetite. I really like how Ryan puts that. What we often mean by love today is appetite, the acquisitive, rapacious, sometimes overtly greedy practice of getting and having and holding on to, either the thing or the feelings we associate with the thing. And it's true, at times God allows us the grace of experiencing love. Take the example of my son Luke. I often feel overwhelming desire, concern, compassion for him, all feelings associated with love. But in truth, it's the things that I've given up for him 
It's the sacrifices that we make for our loved ones that express the true heart of love. And a true gift of self, self-denial, self-emptying love, that doesn't often feel great. It can downright hurt. That's because, again, to quote Pastor Ryan, love isn't a feeling or an appetite, but he adds, it's an act of the will, an act finally of surrender. And here as Christians, we need look no further than the crash that cradled Christ close to the earth or the cross that lifted him far above the human fray. God's incarnate word hidden among the animals in Bethlehem and fixed to a Roman billboard overlooking Jerusalem. And what is that word? St. John says that God is love, which means there is no word that God speaks that is not an expression of God's love. Sometimes that love might feel like a warning or a rebuke, at other times acceptance or restoration, but God's love is not a feeling that God has toward you, a feeling which comes and goes. No. God's love is an eternal and unchanging reality because God is the name for this relentless and generative love that is shared between each person of the Trinity in which spills over into time and space, not just to form creation, but to sustain it, to keep on willing its good, your good and mine. And God cannot act contrary to this love because love is God's very being. It's why St. Paul can write in his first epistle to the Corinthians that faith and hope and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. We often twist this text to serve soft forms of relativism. So we often say, see, it doesn't matter what you believe or what you hope in so long as you're a loving person. But that's not at all the apostle's point. He's saying that someday faith will become sight and what is hoped for will be attained. But love, God's love, will never end because God never ends. And furthermore, if we understand faith and hope and love as theological virtues, dispositions that come through grace as gifts of the Holy Spirit, then we ought to remember this spiritual truth that growth in one virtue is growth in them all, which is intuitive, I think. I mean, you can't truly love one another without also trusting and hoping in that other, which is to say love is the greatest of these virtues because it includes all other virtues within itself. You get love, you get faith and hope as well. Because love isn't a feeling or an appetite, but it's an act of the will, an act of virtue. And as Christians, our model for love is love incarnate. The word of God made flesh come down from heaven to dwell among us, to dwell in our hearts, Jesus Christ, God's love letter to his creation. A letter addressed to Christ at his baptism and through Christ to the whole world. And what is that word that God speaks? Well, it's a word of acceptance and affirmation. You are my children in whom I am well pleased. That's the word we hear when we are baptized into Christ's body. It's a beautiful sentiment. But it's not just a word. It's an action. It's a surrender. It's a sacrifice. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only beloved son. Or John 15, 13. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. In this pericope, notice the verbs. Those three actions our Lord uses to flesh out this love. Love your enemies, how? By doing good and blessing them and praying for them. The deepest human instincts are to do the opposite, 
to retaliate, to curse, to hate. So our Lord calls us to cooperate with his grace, to entrust ourselves to the Spirit's training and discipline and practice and habituation. Eat only junk food and you'll begin to crave only junk food and your health will suffer. Excuse me, your health will suffer. But likewise, if you only react in anger and choose this path again and again, you begin to wear down that path until it becomes the quickest route every time. We call that vice, habits of sin, unhealthy spiritual patterns. But what our Lord is holding up are habits that form the soul in love by conforming our wills to the divine will. And this is never a matter simply of our own efforts, but always an act of surrender to the Holy Spirit in response to the grace of God at work in us, an act of trust and of hope. Because willing the good of those who have hurt and betrayed us never means excusing bad behavior or putting up with abuse but it does commit a disciple of Jesus Christ to a lifetime of learning to let go of resentments and bitterness. A lifetime of learning to desire for others nothing less than what God desires for them, which is that they come to know and to love the very lover of their souls, the one who wills that none should perish, but that all come to repentance. We do it again this Sunday when we gather here in this space, when we engage in our public confession of sin. And what do we receive? Not rebuke, but mercy. And what do we hear? Not words of condemnation, but words of absolution, words of forgiveness. I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Perhaps we can accept that love is not an appetite, but an act of the will, an act of surrender, which is both an act of trust and an act of hope. Maybe we can accept that we are accepted, that God forgives penitent sinners like ourselves in the sacrament of reconciliation. But this business about loving enemies, isn't that a step? too far. Frankly, it seems impossible, either because we perceive our enemies to be so bad or because we operate under the illusion that we have none. But notice, Jesus doesn't say if you make an enemy, here's what to do about it. No, he says, love your enemies. In other words, this is one of the purest, most selfless expressions of love. Because it doesn't just will the good of another, but insofar as we will the good of our enemy, we forego our own good for the sake of someone who wills us evil. And here we stumble upon an often overlooked implication of our Lord's admonition to love our enemies. For some of us, those who live with addiction or depression, affirming the goodness of creation, the goodness of being itself, being able to say, it is good that I exist, that can be a form of enemy love. Deep down, I think we know this, how often we are our own worst enemy, which is one of the reasons our Lord roots love of neighbor in love of self. Because it is only insofar as I receive the gift of self with charity that I am then able to charitably make a gift of self. Or as Jesus put it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now that led Christian author G.K. Chesterton to observe that the Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies probably because generally they are the same people. For some of us, The call to love our enemy is the call to self-love, not in some egocentric or narcissistic way, but in a way that says this is the body and the intellect and the physical capacities and limitations that God has given me. 
And as this body ages and my eyes grow weaker and hairs sprout in strange places, I'm going to choose to love brother bald spot and sister swollen ankles. Instead of seeing my body as an enemy conspiring against me, I'm going to surrender in love toward God and trust in the goodness of this gift. Whether or not I feel useful or appreciated or understood, with God's help, I'm going to practice generosity of spirit. And that doesn't just mean giving charitably, but receiving charitably. I'm going to receive my existence, my being here at all, with gratitude to God. By loving my neighbor, even my enemy, as myself, especially when they are one and the same. Lord, help us to see ourselves and others as you see us, beloved children in whom you are well pleased. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Christians, we are called to confess our sins and to receive our Lord's forgiveness, but also we're called to confess our faith and to receive our Lord's gift of grace. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and the redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord, and to love and to serve your neighbor and your enemy. Thanks be to God. <laughs>